Welcome back to the Nursing Post podcast, All Nursing All the Time with Ashley and Rosa. Today, we discuss the most recently talked about trial and conviction of Redonda Vaughn with our special guest, Cherie Quinn, LPN. Our goal is always to inform and spark conversation. Hi, Cherie. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So tell us just a little bit about yourself before we get started. Okay. I've been a licensed practical nurse for 13 years this year. Yay. And have done a variant of nursing, long-term acute care, hospital, hospice, um, long-term care, SNF, outpatient, pulmonary, which is where I met you guys. And then now I'm primary care. I've done a little bit of college nursing and my favorite breast imaging, probably women's health. That's important. Yes, it is. So I kind of wanted to just get right into it. This is a lot to talk about. There's like just a lot of information to break down, but I do want to take a moment to like make a disclaimer and let people know that yes, we are talking about the Redon Devant case. Um, however, the victim is not lost while we discuss this. So we do recognize that Charlene Murphy is the victim in this case. And no matter what verdict and sentencing that was handed down in this trial will ever bring her back or that impact of loss has had on her family. Absolutely. I think we forget that sometimes that the reason we're ultimately here is um, for the patient. And we can get caught up in this as nurses because it's a scary time to be a nurse. It's a scary time to be in the healthcare profession in general. But as nurses, we agreed to be patient advocates first. And that is never lost on me. No, um, one of the reasons I'm kind of excited to have you on, Shuri, is because you do offer a little bit of a different perspective and a lot of different insight, especially with the different backgrounds that you've, you know, you've held and seen kind of a plethora of different type of patients and you understand nursing, in my opinion, very well. One of the things that I think that you're best at is making sure that you're advocating for the patient. 100%. I know that I've told you before, I'm like, this is like your greatest strength and your, you know, greatest weakness, weakness. kind of all wrapped together into one because you do want what's best for the patient, even if that means that you don't pee or eat and you take on more work. Come in early, you staying late, like the epitome of what most nurses do when they care. Yeah. I feel like I had very good nursing instructors who instilled not only skill, but a the art of nursing, which I think a lot of people fail to recognize. Yes. Because it is an art. Yeah, there's people that are smart enough to be nurses that shouldn't be nurses. And there are people that are meant to be nursing and they have a pull towards nursing and helping people. Um, and those are the people that end up being really, really great nurses. Ashley, do you have some statistics for us? Oh, yes. So we do know that medication errors are the most common at the ordering and prescribing stages. And typical errors include um, the healthcare provider writing the wrong medicine, the wrong route, dose, frequency. And those errors account for about 50% of all medication errors. We do know that nurses and pharmacists identify 30 to 70% of medication ordering errors, which is what we're supposed to do as nurses is catch these things before they get to the patient. Um, that is something that I know that I was taught in nursing school. I know that both of you guys were taught that in nursing school. I believe we all went to different nursing schools, but yeah. it is, it's, so it's something that's taught across the board. Um, but that being said, more than 46,000 death certificates list complication of medical, surgical, medication errors. I mean, medication errors that lead to death is not something that's new in medicine. Um, it causes thousands of deaths a year. And I think that it's important that we learn from those deaths, um, which is kind of, I feel like is a really the double-edged sword with the vault case because she did the right thing as a nurse in reporting her error. 
um, that has led kind of, unfortunately, to her being criminally convicted. She's we're currently awaiting sentencing trials, but um, one of the biggest things that you're supposed to do as a nurse is when there is an error, is that you recognize that error and you report it immediately. So that way you can mitigate any risk, including death of a patient as fast as possible. Absolutely. I think so many different um, facets of this one particular case. Mm -hmm. This might be one of those lengthy episodes for us. Maybe, you know, we won't finish under the normal 30 minutes that we usually do because it's so many facets to it. You know, we're talking about the nurse, the hospital, the pharmacy. We're talking about CMS. We're talking about the Tennessee Board of Nursing. And then we're talking about Tennessee versus Redonda Vaughn. So there's like all these moving pieces to this puzzle. And it's a lot to talk about. For sure. Um, I will say this. You said medication errors reported immediately. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't immediate enough for this patient. She didn't recognize her error until it was too late. And, you know, you give colase by mistake. That's one thing. You give a paralyzing agent by mistake is a complete and utter different thing. So I can't imagine how she felt in the immediate aftermath of knowing that she had given this drug and this is why this patient was going to be taken off life support and ultimately passing. Having to face the family, although I don't know that she ever did, there's no indication in any of the records that I read, Rosa, and maybe you can correct me, that she had any contact with the family in the immediate aftermath of all this that happened. Um, I guess it could be probably because she might have been inconsolable. I know I would have been. I know that there was reference in a CMS um, document that you sent that the physicians were the ones to address the family, which is usually the case. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, we are the last person to touch a medication for it to be given to a patient. We are giving the medicine. So if the error is not found, you know, pharmacy is the first line if the doctor writes the order wrong or enters the order wrong. Um, pharmacy technicians, pharmacy, pharmacist, um, and then us, this is it. We're the front line and LPNs more so because a lot of times LPNs are giving medications in most facilities, including hospitals now, not this type of medicine. I'm not sure an LPN would have been able to pull the agent that she gave. I'm not familiar with that hospital's policy and they're not in our current state. So I right. can't. And I did not, you know, investigate, you know, the limits of what LPNs can and cannot do in that state. I do kind of want to go over a timeline because not only did I send you guys the CMS report, I also sent you guys the actual evidence from the Tennessee versus Redonda Vaughn case. And it's a lot. I think um, the court case had 51 pages and CMS had 56 pages. So we're looking at over a hundred pages of interviews, evidence, and everything else. But Miss Murphy, she was 75 years old. She had been treated prior at the same hospital because she was a previous cancer patient. She um, comes in, they order a PET scan Ms. Murphy asks if she could have something for her anxiety because she's had an MRI prior. She is claustrophobic and she wants something, you know, to kind of knock the edge off. So at that time, radiology calls the doctor. The doctor gives the nurse and the radiologist a verbal order. Then the nurse and radiology calls the floor in which Miss Murphy came from and says the doctor has given a verbal order for Versed one milligram IV. Then the floor nurse is telling them, well, why can't you give it? You know, you're a nurse. And they're telling her that they feel uncomfortable giving the medication and would rather that the floor nurse who is more familiar with the patient come and give it. 
Mm -hmm. I think also they said she should be continually monitored because when you administer Versed, the patient has to be under continuous monitoring. Interventional radiology nurses didn't want to take that on because they probably had other patients and could not be there. They were fully booked and fully scheduled that day. So her PET scan was scheduled for two o'clock. Now, we'll call Redonda Nurse One, and we will call the patient's nurse at that time, Nurse Two, and then the scheduled nurse to that patient, Nurse Three. Okay. Okay. So nurse two tells nurse one to go ahead and give the versed order because nurse three, who was originally scheduled to this patient, had gone to lunch and asked nurse two to cover her patients while she went to lunch. Now, nurse one, who is Redonda, does not normally work this floor. She was floated to this floor under the job description as a help all nurse. And she had an RNT with her. Then after that, she goes to pull the medication out of the medication dispenser. The verbal order is not even entered in there. So she's going into the machine looking for Versed under the brand name, not the generic. She types in the first two letters and what she gets is a totally different medication, but she hasn't at this point realized it yet. She pulls Verconium. I just want to talk kind of like right there, kind of like pause right there and talk about all those steps leading to her pulling the Verconium. And she did that at two. 50, 40, no. 59, 259. Was it 259 that it was administered? I can't remember. It was 259 that it was administered. It was 247 in which the override happened. And the pharmacy didn't even verify it until um, 259. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? So it was, it was entered in at 247, verified by pharmacy, I'm sorry, at 249. And then it was pulled and over and overridden at 259, even though this PET scan was already like scheduled at two o'clock. She also typed in two letters of a medicine. Yeah. yeah. B -E. Come on now. I'm sorry. I just don't get that. I don't get it at all because if I was taught anything, it was to protect myself and I can't protect myself if I'm not protecting the patient. Right. It all goes back to the same thing. Why on God's green earth would you only type in two letters of a name? Why would you not look at the bottle and verify what it was when you pulled it out? I do that. That's my, that was my practice always. Granted, it gets busy, but she admits herself she wasn't busy. That was my thing. She was distracted by talking to her orientee, not busy trying to manage another patient's medicine or a code. And she said herself, she became complacent. So negligence, I think we all agree on that. I think that most people in the nursing community would agree that there were too many steps that were missed. There's a big difference when you're in an ER and pulling medicine and overriding it and, you know, giving it before pharmacy has a chance to confirm it versus a patient needing something to relax them for a PET scan. You know, that paranoia that I have, um, I just, from step one, I know as a nurse, if I'm being called by radiology and told I received a verbal order from the physician, can you give this medication? I would have said, you know, because nurse two was the one who, who got that, you know, phone call from radiology. I would have been like, um, I can't take a verbal order from a radiology tech or another nurse. I would need that verbal order directly from the physician. That's my, that was where I was thinking, first of all, I was like, I would have never, ever, ever, ever as a nurse been like, oh, just because you said this doctor gave you a verbal order that I'm going to go ahead and give it. Yep. Never in my life. 
Mm-mm. You're right. Well, that nurse should have entered that verbal order. And once it was in, then the nurse could have at that point, after it was verified by a pharmacy, then given the medicine. Can we go back to that for a second? Because I know you quoted some times earlier and I'm looking at it. So it says um, under the CMS thing, review the medication order. It was entered, revealed the physician ordered it at 3 p.m. Okay. But That's when he docked. He gave, yes. Right. He revealed the order was entered. So the report revealed the order was entered at 247. And then verified by pharmacy at, at 249. 249. And then she pulled the medicine at 259. at 259. So there was a very short time, which this, this drug works in less than a minute. Yep. In less than a minute. I mean, she must have just pushed and left. She must have just literally pushed this medicine and immediately left the patient because it wasn't until almost 30 minutes later, 26, I think, somewhere around there, that they call the code. Mm -hmm. So even if she thought she was administering Versed, she should have stayed. The doctor said that she didn't need to be monitored, though, right? right? But I'm sorry, as a nurse, this is me and my patient. Yep. I don't give a shit what the doctor says. Well, and I think that's exactly what we need to emphasize is that right there, because so many nurses, especially new nurses, kind of have this idea of the doctor said it, so it's set in stone, so it has to be right because they are the ones who went through school and for all these years, so they know more than me. And I think that there is a little bit of that awe factor with new nurses that I think it, it, it kind of wanes as, as you, the more you nurse, the more you realize that not every doctor is really that smart. Created um, equal. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that to be ugly, but not all providers are created equal. No. And I think that when you start working with providers more, you start to, you start to pick up on things. You mean, things are habit and repeat of a lot of things that are in medicine. There's a ton of protocols because things follow a certain course, you know, most of the time. So I think it's really important that we, as, especially as the more seasoned nurses are really emphasizing to new nurses and nurses while they're training that it is your job to make sure that you question the doctor. And if that doctor hoots and hollers and yells, that's fine. Like you can write a report up on it, document it, do whatever you got to do. But so many nurses are tired of being yelled at and berated by doctors, but there will be, once there's enough complaints on them, administration will have to do something and say, hey, you can't talk to people like that. Yeah, that's the least of your worries as a nurse. Yeah, I have no issues with that. Yeah, that's what happened right here. This is the most of your worry. This is, this is your worry always harming a patient. Mm -hmm. Well, then my second question when I was going into this was like, okay, her PET scan was at two. She had already been there way beyond, you know, the time for the PET scan. Why IV versed? Why didn't the physician in this case just not prescribe something PO? Well, because it takes so much longer to work. But they yeah. had to wait an hour anyway because she had to be contrasted for the PET scan. And it takes an hour for that to even circulate through the body. So I, you're not in the PET scan for that whole hour waiting. Right. I think it's force of habit. You know, when people are in the hospital, so many things are done IV. I think it's just like, it, it's not, I wouldn't think twice about why PO versus IV. Like it just, she has IV access pull up a, you know, milligram of her said, give it to her, go on about their day. Like I, and they're, and they're busy admittedly um, from our own statements that they were busy. They were fully scheduled in the schedule. radiology department. Mm-hmm. So they were like, let's just do this, get it done because the patient was going to go home. The patient was on their way out. Is that so right? I think or that's part of it. I think it's just habit. You know, yeah. partially that prescribing habit, like, oh, you know, the IV, it works quicker. Go ahead, get it in their system let them be nice and relaxed so that way they can go ahead and do the scan so the patient can leave. Well, needless to say, you know, 30 minutes later, Ms. Murphy was found unresponsive. They resuscitated her, but she never gained consciousness. Um, She ended up dying 
around like 1 a.m. the next day because they decided to pull life support measures. Right. And during this whole code is when Redonda was like, you know what? I administered the wrong medication. But it, it was only when nurse two yes. told nurse one, yes. is this the medication you gave? Because the med she had put the medication into a biohazard bag with the bottle and the syringe that was used. And she gave it to nurse two mm -hmm. to prove and verify that she had given the medication. Right. If I'm not mistaken, photos of evidence so that she had written Versed on the bag. Yes. And the time I think was on there. Yeah. Um, and the time in which she gave it, because all of that's like for documenting purposes and stuff. Right. Um, and at that time when the nurse was like, is this the bag, you know, and she's like, this isn't Versed. This is Berconium. That's like Redonda admitted it. Yeah. Like she was like, Yes, I, I gave that medication and she went and reported it to the doctor. She went, went and reported it to the nurse practitioner and she reported it to everybody that she was supposed to report it to. But this is where, to me, it goes south. Mm -hmm. She was not allowed to document. She was told not to document. Mm -hmm. So this is where it really gets messed up. So at this point, she's made a detrimental med error that should be immediately not only taken care of by, you know, the doctor, but also should have been reported to the board of nurses. Like there's a, there's a whole incident report that should have been done. But where I get frustrated within this case is to me, this is where the lies began. I agree. This is systemic. Yes, we all have acknowledged that Redonda was negligent. But it wasn't just Redonda. We're talking about the pharmacist, the doctor, nurse number two, all of them, you know, have a, a role in this situation. Like Cherie said, we're like the last final defense against medication errors. You know, the doctor is number one, the pharmacist is number two, and then the nurse is number three. And if you're doing your five, you know, rights of med administering, then a lot of this would have been caught. Yep. And she admitted, and it's proven that, you know, she didn't do that. Right. She didn't follow all those right steps. She didn't double check to make sure she had the right dose and the right medication and the right strength. She recalls that she was told, you know, one to two milligrams of Versed, but she believes that she gave one. So there's like a, a lot of fault here. Then the pharmacy entered in for Versed, but did not check back to see whether the medication had been pulled, but they had an override in the system that they didn't even review. The Verconium override, they didn't even review that. Yep, because we get, you know, just like when you work long-term care, Rosa and Ashley, you get what we call alarm fatigue because you hear these alarms in your sleep. Literally, they true. All, all the time. Mm -hmm. Call bells, bed alarms, everything. You just hear it over and over. One out of, you know, 25 alarms may be something alarming, but most mm -hmm. of the time it's, I need to go to the bathroom or a patient's trying to get up. You get that a lot, especially with dementia patients. Um, in the hospital, you have alarms going off for multiple reasons. You've got telemetry alarms. You've got ventilator alarms. You've got IV pump alarms. You've got call bell alarms. And so we get complacent, as Redonda said herself, because can you imagine being in the fight or flight 24-7 or, you know, 12 hours out of the day? You have to sort of adapt and adapting sometimes leads to complacency and therefore the same thing happens when you're in that pyxis or you're in the acudose and you're pulling medicine and oh there's a warning a warning a warning but in this case you know these things that she there's so many things that went wrong it was almost like you know the swiss cheese 
scenario. Yep. There I are mean, a lot of holes everywhere. There, I mean, there's so many holes <laughs> in this. I can't even, I can't even call it Swiss cheese. I don't even think it's a whole slice. They don't even have a slice of cheese. There's no cheese there. No cheese. So many steps. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like you miss one alarm, but you miss 10. Yeah. You miss that many warning signs. But this wasn't new. This the thing about this is the pharmacy knew that nurses were overriding medications on a regular basis. Yeah. The pharmacy knew this. No one ever initiated to correct that systematic failure or yep. training, period. Mm-hmm. The hospital knew about it. Yeah, but also not knowing your meds. Verse said doesn't have to be yes. constituted, okay? Yes. No, I'm total in total agreement. I'm in total agreement. And why was, you know, I know I read in the CMS about why this medicine's even kept in in the Acudose or Pixis on their four and how they've chosen this dose, this medication's been taken out and they've replaced it with another medication that has the same effect because of emergent and urgent situations, which I understand. So number two, you're right. According to the CMS report, this medication was never supposed to be in the same section with all the other medications. It was supposed right. to be quarantined and held by itself in a different location within the machine because of the seriousness of the medication. Right. It takes less than a minute for this medicine to work. That aside, why not have a system where you have to have a cosigner? You have to have a cosigner to destroy narcotics. Right. To give insulin. You have to have a witness. So why not have a cosigner in these situations? Is that something you can override? I mean, these are questions we want to learn from this, sure. But I think we have a lot more to talk about because there's bigger issues at play when we're talking about corporations, healthcare corporations in general, and the hospitals a fault in this at covering it up, in my opinion. So we've only touched like the real like basis of just Redonda Vaughn. So we know that she took a verbal order, not directly from a physician. She actually took it third person at this point because the doctor, then radiology, then nurse number two, and then Redonda. So she's like actually the fourth person to hear about this order. And then she gives the wrong medication because she typed in two letters of the brand name, didn't even think when it came up that maybe I should check for the generic, which we all have iPhones and cell phones that we carry in our pocket now. It would have been a simple Google search. I think we're all in agreement with that. She then overrid the system for the wrong medication. She administered the wrong medication. She did not stay at bedside to observe for any adverse reactions. She did not verify the medication or the strength that was given to the patient at that time. Like we, we have all already admitted to that much. But I think the biggest thing in this case is, like I said, I don't think that nurses are under the impression that she wasn't in the wrong. I think everybody goes, yeah, she, she, she fucked up. She messed up royally. There's no going back from that. But my thing of it is the family really wasn't told. Um, Then the hospital tried to cover it up, even down to the medical examiner. There are so many different issues that go beyond just the nursing aspect that the only person that's getting any kind of punishment or um, any kind of... Yeah, but I mean, it's it's only her. Like, it's okay that the doctors lied about this. I mean, it's okay that it was trying to be covered up. Like, why is it that the one person who actually admitted to their mistake is the one that's getting thrown under the bus? And that's why I love you, Ashley. So I, I think this is the perfect segue to take a quick break and then come back and discuss what happened after. So we know the facts, we know everything that led up to and including Miss Murphy's death. I kind of want to touch on the backside, what happened after. I want to talk about the hospital. I want to talk about the Tennessee Board of Nursing. I want to talk about CMS. Like, I want to talk about all of that when we come back. 
Thanks for listening to today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you know someone else who would also like this episode, please share it with them. You can find other episodes on your favorite podcast platforms and be sure to visit our website, thenursingpostpodcast.com for references on this episode and our merch.